Uh, welcome everyone. This is the work in progress and industry pitch session. Um, thank you all for coming uh, and attending the session in different time zones. And it's a pleasure. My name is Rayleigh Jaipal and it's my pleasure to uh, chair this session. We have a number of speakers today, uh, which will culminate with uh, the, the first set of industry speakers. And this would be an industry pitch. Uh, so we'll start with the work in progress papers. And the, we have the first speaker, uh, Hagen Jong. Hagen Jong is a PhD student at Hangyang University from South Korea. Jong is particularly interested in Linux systems and IoT. And today he'll be talking to us on a post patching technique for imprecise computing by saving resource. Uh, huh? uh, Hang Young, uh, take it on. Take yes, uh, the stage is yours. Can you share? Can you give me a permission to share? Oh, ah, okay. So while he is being set up, I had a quick announcement about questions. Uh, if you have any questions, there are two ways to address them. Uh, you can, for people watching online, uh, you can uh, post your questions on the chat. I will be watching that. Or uh, if you, uh, once the speaker is done, uh, we can open up the floor for questions if you want to unmute yourself and uh, raise your questions. And this goes for the, the people at the uh, longer, uh, longer room uh, at Shanghai also. Thank you. Uh, Hegyon, it's yours. Oh, can you see my presentation? Okay. Yes. I will start. <clears throat> Good afternoon. My name is Hegyon Zhang. I am a PhD student from the Department of Computer Science and Engineering at Hanyang University. I'm happy to be here and to have opportunity to present my research in this session. Today, I will brief you uh, on my research work in progress, Apache technique uh, for imprecise computing by saving resource. Uh, here is the introduction. In general, software should be updated periodically for added feature, security, and etc. But under normal case, uh, restart is required to update the software. Uh, we have developed a technique that allows us to patch without restarting. And we assume that hot patching can be used for imprecise computing. We conducted our research with the following goals. First, uh, implement hot patching technique and apply it to F binary. Second, uh, make and apply an imprecise patch and check if uh, computing resource usage is decreasing. Uh, here is the hot patching tool design. This figure shows the overall structure of the hot patching tool. As you can see, the hot patcher runs independently of the target application. The hot patcher is divided into four modules on um, image creator and hot patching modules. If you look at the picture, it is divided into an um, image creator and the other modules. Oh. The target application figure shows the situation before and after patching. After patching, the image is loaded into shared memory and you can see the execution flow is changed. Uh, here is the patching tool implementation. In this part, I will show you how to make patch image and hot patching process briefly. To create patch image, we have to go through three step process. First, get assembly code from existing code. And second, change the function call as an indirect in call and collect or reference object. Finally, compile the transformed assembly code. This structure makes hot patching uh, easily. Uh, for hot patching technique, we should follow the steps. Create shared memory, check a patch, shared memory injection, copy cut patch image, trampoline code injection. Mm, your five steps to proceed with this process, we use the Pitrace debugging system core. Uh, 
Details for each step with constant step are on the poster. <clears throat> Here is the experiment and result. We tested an application that calculates the square root. We create a patch image with a difference of about 0.05% in the result. Then instructions and cycles of the application were measured using the PERF tool. As a result, we could confirm that instruction and cycle were reduced by 8.0% and 17.2% uh, 17 respectively. Uh, in conclusion, we confirmed that hot patching was performed, instruction and cycles were reduced. Uh, the hot patching latency was found to be approximately 4 milliseconds which is expected to be usable in software RT in future uh, software real time. In future work, uh, we plan to implement a patching based in precise computing on real time Linux and apply with criticality. We plan to experiment with scenarios that require imprecise patch due to external circumstances. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, anyone have uh, questions? Please unmute yourself and uh, ask a question. Okay. Uh, if you later think about a question, you can definitely uh, reach out to the uh, presenter uh, at the poster session that is uh, later today. Uh, shall we move on to the next? Riley, you are muted. Sorry. Uh, any questions, anyone? Uh, uh, if you have any questions, please uh, reach out to the presenter uh, later at the poster session. Uh, we're moving on to the next speaker. Um, the next speaker is Robert uh, Rizasad Chodorek, is currently an assistant professor with the Institute of Telecommunications. Faculty of Computer Science, Electronics and Telecommunications, the AGH University of Science and Technology, Kharkov, Poland. He received a PhD in Computer Science from the AGH University of Science and Technology. He's a senior member of IEEE and IEEE Computer Society, the IEEE Communication Society. He's primarily interested in computer architecture, IoT, computer networks, and multimedia. He is the author and co-author of over 100 research papers and two books. He's going to talk to us today about a browser-driven sensor service for embedded IoT. Uh, please, Robert, go ahead. Uh, thank you. I would like to present a browser-driven sensor service for embedded IoT. The current uh, solution for connecting IoT and web environment is to build a web server inside uh, IoT devices. This method is some limitation for more complex uh, solution. Uh, therefore, we test uh, another um, solution that uh, our application is run as a single page application inside web browser, web browser running in powerful uh, IoT devices using uh, WebRTC technology. WebRTC technology, it's currently indicated that uh, solution for some uh, complex uh, um, transmission allows to transmit uh, data and real-time mm, video, for example. Uh, we built a uh, system which uh, we use a flying I IoT station. Uh, this is our air station. On this uh, air station, we run WebRTC application. Uh, this is uh, WebRTC application work inside web browser. Web browser work in headless mode, therefore it's only uh, processing uh, data from this uh, air station. Uh, this from this air station, we can transmit data from many sensors uh, connected uh, directly to a single board computer, also connected via uh, wireless technology. It uh, allows uh, WebRTC to connect uh, uh, 
autonomous uh, IoT devices with uh, Bluetooth technology, for example, and allows to transmit in real time video and also connected data from many sensors. Our secondary application is work on the ground station, and this application receives data, real time video, uh, and also data from the sen sensors and can put them uh, to another system. Uh, sensor service uh, is uh, required to internalization on sensors and that, uh, data gathering from many uh, systems. Our uh, single board computer is Raspberry Pi, which uh, run this uh, uh, web environment. It's a web environment for our application. We use the same application for ground station and air station, but with different uh, starting parameter uh, for uh, air station, which run uh, sensor services, gathering data, and uh, sending them to the ground station. We evaluate in several uh, tests uh, uh, this uh, um, web environment is sufficient to transmit uh, video data in high quality video data and connected with uh, several uh, information from sensors uh, like temperature, pressure, uh, gas sensor, and pollution sensor. Web environment is a um, good solution for uh, this um, complex application which can transmit both uh, uh, data um, from several sensors and uh, some real-time data. We use this, uh, our tests uh, for monitoring uh, some parking area, uh, for monitoring pollution in our system. Thank you. Uh, please, if you have questions, please unmute yourself. Okay, uh, we're running late a little bit, so we keep moving on to the next speaker. Thank you, Robert. Uh, if you have questions uh, later on, please do reach out to the presenter at the poster. Uh, the next speaker is Yu Ting Li. Yu Ting Li is currently pursuing a PhD degree in uh, with Professor W. S. Zhao group at uh, Beihang University. Her research interests mainly include system integration, the application of MRAM, near memory computing, and neural network accelerator design. She won the university demo best demonstration in ACM Zig DAO 21. Best Presentation Award in ICCC 21, and the finalist in ISLPD uh, 21 Design Contests. And Yu Ting is going to talk to us today about uh, her work toward energy efficient near STT MRAM processing architecture for neural networks. Yu Ting, please take it away. Okay, thank you, Hoster. Hello, everyone. I'm Yue Ting Li from Beihang University. It's my great honor to share my work on Codex and the IEEE's. And the first, I want to give some background uh, related to MRAM. Uh, Professor Ford uh, invent, uh, invented the following three levels to realize the high and the low resistance to present zero of one for binary storage. This coverage has inspired academia and industry to explore hand-drawn application for memory. Since then, the decenter of the memory has improved more than 100,000 times over the 13 years of the development history in various domains. However, the development of the computing systems also brings two major uh, bottlenecks, data latency and uh, power consumption portion, which led to the very no memory, memory wall. Yeah. Memory wall and uh, power wall. They led to the evolution of the complex memory and uh, architectures are used to lighten the negative impact of the two worlds. However, it increased the power and uh, speed up. 
Therefore, I'm going to come on uh, how to research topic and apply it to the smartwatch can achieve up to 14 days in standby mode. For the memory wall, near memory computing can propose solutions based on the above requirements. So we propose near MRAM computing in its design, DRAM caching matrix uh, acquired by the CMOS module, uh, and uh, SDM RAM more the weight during inference. SDM RAM is uh, located in the development uh, switchable uh, domain and uh, managed as uh, uh, adjust as the core reference. The system bus with the DRAM, DMA buffers for the CSR or CSC format to transfer data. More especially, the near memory controller with five signals for recon, uh, reconfiguration max updates the mic is only, only wake up when the clock and enable signals are high. The controller light space uh, matrix vector to transform non zero weights or inputs and uh, operate with the max that achieve the optimized scheme with only necessary. Uh, multiple applications. The above is a uh, select uh, profile to select the uh, application, and uh, if you want uh, several megs for different levels in neutral network. In the future, I will well, and uh, in we still do these things, and we will extend and perfect this design, including uh, the SDM RAM, the readout screen at the circuit uh, level, and uh, your memory uh, perfect architecture at the system uh, level. This uh, That's all I wanted to share today, and uh, this is my email. If you have any questions or ideas, you can connect me and I will get back to you as soon as possible. Thanks for your listen and uh, thanks, Eddie. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have a very quick question. The, the reconfigurable architecture that you showed, is it uh, close to an NPU or how different is it from an, the generic NPUs that you need? Neural processing units. Hello, could you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, but uh, I, I can't uh, hear it clearly. How, how, how? Okay, uh, so uh, you, you, in your slide, you talked about uh, a reconfigurable architecture. Uh, the, the reconfigurable architecture for the Mac units and the neural networks, right? So how, mm -hmm. how does this compare with the generic uh, NPU that we know of? Oh, yeah. Um, I also think it's not only related to the near memory computing, but it's also related to the specific work. And uh, we must do, and uh, in these days uh, and in this month, we do some work about the neutral network, uh, uh, about a pole touch to do training or inference to get the Maybe we can say the data sites and uh, how to move it and uh, how to train it, we depend on themselves. So now we do this work and uh, continue want to, to from the uh, device level and uh, uh, yeah, and uh, because we can see the power port, uh, some work is focused on the circuit level and uh, we want to do some uh, device level to uh, uh, architecture level. Uh, th this is a, a, a full storage about how to say and how to uh, use the MDRAM the advantage and uh, to use the uh, software and uh, hardware uh, co-design to uh, mm, how, how to say draw up the maybe but I can say the draw of this uh, advantage of the MRM. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, yeah, uh, uh So anyone else has questions? Okay. Uh, okay, moving on to the next speaker, uh, Ying Shui Gao is from the University of Science and Technology of China. 
and a major in computer science and technology. And today they're going to talk to us about Hetero RW, a generalized and efficient framework for random walks in graph analysis. Inshray, please take it. Okay. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Yin Xue Gao. Uh, today, I will present our work, Hetero RW, a generalized and efficient framework for random walk in graph analysis. Uh, graph random walk is used to find a subgraph to estimate the original graph. However, random walk is notorious for its dynamic and sparse assessment pattern. In addition, the variety of random walk algorithms also bring new challenges to the acceleration customization. Existing framework fail to cover the random walk. So, this work proposes Hetero RW, a hierarchical acceleration framework to enhance random walk on LPGAs. Uh, Hetero RW uh, first identify two phases features and design hardware architecture. Especially, the construction phase customize a data flow to map a series or sequential operation and explore the multi-level pipeline screen. Uh, the sampling phase customize a memory architecture for advanced memory sizes. Finally, Hetero RW integrates a novel scheduling layer to partition the input data and perform uh, de a design space exploration. Uh, figure 1 shows the overview. It consists of three layers and involves two phases. The input layer contains the pro programming interface for users to provide the customization information for the uh, target random walk algorithm. Uh, Hetero RW integrates a novel schedule layer to perform the design space exploration. The hardware layer contains acceleration generation and hardware execution models. The former is responsible for building, uh, uh, for building accelerators. The latter is re response for the execution of hardware engines. As for the two phases, the blue arrow corresponds to the construction uh, phase flow, and the red arrow corresponds to the sampling phase flow. Uh, figure 2 shows the construction architecture. Uh, cons consisting of multi multiple processing units. Uh, each processing unit involves a receiver, a distributor, and a constructor. Three models imply the fine-grained pipeline responsibility. Moreover, each, each model has a state chain to implement the coarse-grained pipeline. Uh, figure 3 shows the architecture of sampling model. It schedule workers' execution to mask uh, data dependency and achieve high perform, uh, uh, high throughput. Then, a memory architecture is designed to provide a size pulse according the, to the uh, degree of vertex, while efficiently simplifying the architecture acceleration process. Compared with baseline, Hetero RW can achieve up to 4.3 times performance gains. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Any questions, people? Please unmute yourself if you've joined us just now. Uh, please unmute yourself and ask a question. Um, okay, so we're moving on to the, the next speaker. The next speaker, uh, the next speaker is Nan Hu, is currently working towards his PhD in Embedded Systems Lab of the University of Science and Technology of China. His research interests include reconfigurable computing and embedded systems. And he's going to talk to us today about uh, his work on scheduler for collaborated FPGA GPU CPU based on intermediate language. Nan, please present. FPGA has been widely adopted to accelerate and reduce energy consumption. In recent years, the low price system on chip contains multiple CPU and mobile GPU that can be used as general purpose accelerator. 
The motivation is that CPU and GPU offload partial tasks from the FPGA in order to reduce the FPGA resource consumption without affecting performance. It's necessary to expand the scheduling method to heterogeneous computing. The development difference between serial programs and FPGA brings complexity for mapping an identical algorithm to different types of processors. The modules of FPGA can be optimized according to the algorithm's requirements dynamically by the scheduler. Therefore, we propose a scheduling algorithm for collaborated FPGA, GPU, and CPU. This slide shows the workflow of servant execution flow model. An application is abstracted as a data flow driven processing system consisting of servants and execution flow. The servant stands for task level function module that is the basic unit of scheduling in the heterogeneous computing. The servants run in parallel by the special pipeline structure. The execution flow represents data flow between the servants that is responsible for the communication and the synchronization. A servant consists of two critical elements, kernel function and the parametric instantiation. The kernel function is an algorithm described by the intermediate language implement of data flow diagram. The executable code of the package processor is generated from the kernel function and architecture specific instantiation parameters. A study real-time embedded system 3D weapons, storage, or CD scope is built by four commonly used algorithms. S1, string matching, S2, matrix addition, S3, crystallogram, and S4, contrast stretching. OpenCV with OpenM is pooling is used as an experimental design. CPU with SMD achieves most 2.7 times speed up than the OpenC framework. GPU achieves most 3.8 times, and FPGA achieves most 10.5 times. The scheduling algorithm gives a real-time solution. S1 and S2 are mapped to FPGA, while S3 and S4 are mapped to GPU. Compared with the real-time solution of pure FPGA, it achieves 79% performance with 65% results. So now, uh, your hello, Nan. Your your presentation has been. Your slides are no more visible to us. Yeah. Right. 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 Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Any questions, people? Okay, so moving on to the next uh, presenter. Unfortunately, the presenter could not join us now. So we have a backup video that we will be uh, uh, broadcasting. And if you have any questions, please reach out to the presenter, uh, Tinia Obao. He's a research, assist research assistant at the Villanova Security and Cryptography University uh, Lab. He is currently pursuing a PhD at Villanova University. He has a master's and a bachelor's degree in computer science. Research directions uh, in focus are on post-quantum cryptography, FPGA-based hardware design, and side channel attacks. Uh, Abhijit, could you play the video? Can you see the video? Hello, everyone. My name is Tanya Bao. Yes. OK. Today, I will talk about our paper. High performance historic hardware accelerator for ring binary learning with arrows based post quantum cryptography. This paper presents an efficient hardware systolic accelerator for ring binary learning with arrows based post quantum cryptography, targeting high performance applications. Next, I will talk about the algorithmic background, accelerator structure, and performance comparison. Let's talk about the preliminaries. The major arithmetic operation of the RBLWE-based PQC will be like as figure 1 shows. 
this polynomial multiplications followed by a polynomial addition. Then we can define the major algorithmic operation as w equals d times b plus g mod fx and fx equals n power of x plus 1. Then we can transfer equation 1 into equation 2. Based on the previously mentioned mathematical derivation, we write targeted polynomial multiplication into pseudo code as shown here. The outer loop denotes with parameter j will be executed for n times in n cycles. The inner loop denotes with i will be executed in parallel in a single cycle. We created the proposed hardware structure to achieve this. We have n process elements or PE. In each PE, g and d are fixed. B is serial input and W will be cycled among the PEs. Inside the PE, we use a multiplier on the top, an adder on the bottom, and a register to store the data. In Table 1, we can see that the proposed design has smaller area time complexity than the ex existing one, like reference 5 or 7. For n equals to 256, the proposed design has 9.6% less ADP than reference 7, similar to n equals to 512. Here is the conclusion. We have proposed an efficient hardware systolic accelerator for ring binary learning with error-based post-quantum cryptography. Our future work is design a more efficient accelerator with novel algorithmic architectural innovation to set channel analysis on the accelerator. Attacks and countermeasures are also required to be developed. Japan Xie was supported by NSF and NIST. Jose L. Imana was supported by MCIN, AEI, ERDF, a way of making Europe, and by the CM. Thanks for watching. Thank you. So the next speaker is going to be from the uh, from the Shanghai room uh, live. Uh, is the speaker ready? Hi, Riley. Uh, the next speaker has also joined online on Zoom. So whatever is oh, okay. convenient. Oh, okay. Okay, perfect. Uh, so the next speaker is Jiang Wan. Uh, is currently working towards a master's degree in the College of Computer Science and Software Engineering of uh, Shenzhen University under supervision of Assistant Professor Chen Lin Ma. His research interests include embedded systems, operating systems, and the next generation memory storage architecture designs. Uh, okay. Perfect. Uh, we can see your slides. Thank you. And please proceed. Okay. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me clearly and see the PowerPoint? Yes, to both. Yes. Thank you. Now, let's begin. Hi, everyone. Today, I will introduce, I will introduce our work in progress. Plug a learned secondary index toward LSM tree, resource-constrained embedded storage systems. So here is the overview of the of my talk. We will first introduce the background, and then we will introduce the luck, and we'll talk about the evaluation. So the key value stores are adopted in various embedded applications. And among the key value stores, the LSM tree is the most popular key value store architecture. The LSM tree converts random writes to sequential writes. It first uh, writes the data into the memory table, and then the data is persistent to the SS table in order. Uh, for To retrieve a specific data record, it requires multiple level search, for example, from 
level zero to level one, level two, etc. So this may cause serious risk amplification. The demands of data analysts from frequent searches for non-primary keys. So the secondary index is, in, uh, is created to support efficient non-primary key lookups. Given a secondary key, it outputs the primary keys. So LSM tree as secondary index has several challenges. First, it faces the read amplification for LSM layer structure. And the second one, LSM, uh, the multiple level secondary index brings space consumption. So this is non-negligible. So our motivation is below, is showing on the power points. The recent post, uh, the recent post learning index is uh, in, in that structure utilize machine learning to, uh, uh, to optimize the lookup performance. And the sort of functional dependencies means that one attribute can be estimated by other attributes. So uh, we can use this soft FD to compress the index space. Inspired by the learned index and soft functional dependencies, we want to build an efficient and lightweight secondary index. So here is the lack overview. Uh, first, we adapt the key value store structure, which we will talk uh, next. The second one, we learned the distribution of the secondary keys. And last, we learned the mapping of the secondary index to compress their size. So the first one, for the key value store structure, we adopt the key value separation. Given a secondary key, uh, which is shown on the slide, which is SK. LSM tree outputs the primary key's location. And then according to the location, the lag achieves the, uh, uh, retrieves the primary keys. Uh, accordingly, because the key value store structure is changed, so we adapt the new data operations, including put, get, delete, and compaction. Second, we learn the distribution of the secondary keys. This is because the secondary keys in the SS tables are stored in short in secondary index. So we utilize these characteristics to employ the greedy PR algorithm to build the learned index models. And third, how do we learn the mapping of the secondary index? Uh, we mentioned soft FD just now. The soft, uh, uh, the soft functional dependencies can use to compress the index. Uh, here we use the piecewise linear models to, uh, to approximate these dependencies. So here I take for take an example for here. With the soft FD, the origin for index A and the for index B can be replaced. By the original for index A and plus a lightweight learned index B. So, in this way, the index structure here can be reduced. This is the primary results of our uh, experiments. From the experiments, we can see that luck improves the non primary key lookup performance and throughput with less space consumption. So, that's all of my presentation. And thank you. Thank you, Chenyan. Uh, any questions from the room? Online? Yeah, there is one in Shanghai. Please. Okay, I know that you have a soft functional dependency in your design, right? Yeah. So, oh, I have a question is that will the soft FD a better learning index lookup performance since the performance is, is important. Uh, oh, well, thank you. That's a good question. So here, let me get to the get back to the overview. So 
So here we can see that the soft functional dependencies in the is the entry of this system. Maybe uh, because if you uh, if you not query uh, index on this soft functional dependencies attributes, we can directly go to this section. So uh, in fact, I think the learned learn index and the soft FD benefit from each other because uh, the learned uh, because the learned index because the original index uh, is space can be reduced by the soft functional dependencies. Uh, so we can construct a lightweight index. So in this way, you can reduce the secondary memory, uh, secondary index memory footprint. And uh, the soft functional dependencies mean, uh, we now talk about it may map uh, attributes to another attribute, but this mapping is approximate. It is not accurate. Yeah. So if you uh, map this index attributes to another attributes, this way contain some false positives. So how we how do we uh, correct these false positives? So we we can uh, we we should we should go uh, we should go through the index and to retrieve the full record, and then we uh, and then we validate it. So in this way, the lookup uh, this process will enhance the lookup process. So if we use secondary index in this process, we may accelerate this validation process. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ling uh, Okay, so uh, we're coming to the, the last but not least, the, the industry pitch. Uh, which is uh, which is uh, the first of its kind in ES Week. We introduced the industry track this year. Some of you might have seen the industry session yesterday. Uh, so this is a part of the uh, industry track, and we are happy to have Marcel Bemister from Solid Sands, the founder of Solid Sands. So before starting Solid Sands, Marcel was an assistant professor at the University of Amsterdam and later switched to the industry as a compiler developer at ACE, Associated Compiler Experts. He loves the C programming language right from the first day he picked up KNR's book because it provides a direct connection with the machine at high performance. Marcel Bimster is a a uh, 25 plus year professional of computer technology with a PhD in computer science from the University of Amsterdam. Like he also worked as an assistant professor. From 1999, he was a senior software engineer at ACE to manage a wide range of compiler development projects. Since early 2013, his focus shifted to the support, maintenance and development of the super test compiler test and validation suite for C and C++. Marcel co-founded Solid Sands in 2014 in order to put his full attention to compiler validation and its application in safety critical application development. Marcel is going to talk to us today about SuperGuard and this is intended to be a, a pitch meaning uh, to, uh, to raise discussions and uh, trigger uh, productive discussions uh, amongst attendees um, either now online or, or later at the poster session to uh, where the presenter would be available to answer questions. But uh, please, uh, Marcel, it's, the stage is yours. Uh, we are unable to hear you, Marcel. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, let me talk about SuperCard. So we are a small company. We are supplying uh, the world with test suite for C and C++ compilers and libraries. Uh, we do that worldwide. So also in, in Asia, where uh, the conference is now. Uh, and I want to talk today particularly about library qualification 
for safety critical applications. Now, if you uh, work in safety critical applications, then um, there are rules of, of, of yeah, what you have to do to make sure that your application is suitable for that purpose. And yeah, you are working possibly with high risk uh, applications and maybe in automotive, but it could also be in energy or uh, uh, yeah, many other applications where yeah, people are really at risk when your software is not good. So it it is important that you also make sure that your software is right and also the tools that you use, and particularly the library, works well. So um, what do you do for library qualification? Now, the library that you use may come from uh, the compiler or software development kit that you're using, or it could be a pre-certified library. Uh, it could also be an open source library. Uh, you could even make your own library. Any of these are possible. So there's no restriction in, in any of these for use in safety critical applications, but you have to take care of the proper procedures of uh, qualifying the compiler. Now, qualifying the, comp uh, qualifying the library. Now, qualifying the library is mostly done uh, with requirements-based testing. That's the best method that we have to show that the software is reliable. And I've shown here the, the V model, uh, where on the left side, we have the specification of the, the library, the, the application, uh, with at the bottom, the implementation, the actual implementation. And then on the right side, we see at every level, similar levels of, of uh, abstraction, we see the associated testing uh, with it. And at every level, you present with a test evidence that uh, the corresponding level is correctly uh, implemented. Now for the uh, library, that means that we have to have a requirement-based test suite. And uh, the tests are uh, in a sense, not so difficult. You can write uh, plenty of tests. We have a large collection of them, uh, but you have to show really how they match to the language standard, how they match to the requirements. And I've made here a differentiation between the ISO C standard and the requirements because they are not the same. You might think, okay, I have a specification. It's an ISO specification that must be good enough uh, for my requirements. But if you dive into the requirements, then you see that it's really not so simple. So here's a, uh, an example of a function specification, STRN copy function. Uh, there's some text over here. Um, and that is the full specification of this STRN copy function. Now, if we look a little bit more closely at what it says here, uh, yeah, we know that the STRN copy function is supposed to copy uh, a string in, in S1 into S2, but actually it never says so here in this specification. It only says that the string copy function copies not more than n character. It doesn't say it has to copy so many characters. It only says it's not copying something. And then in parentheses, there's another sentence that says there's another stuff not copied here. So there's some kind of assumption of, of eagerness of this copy function uh, behind this. Um, and that's, that's a bit weird. Now, I'm not saying that this is totally wrong or, or bad or anything. We usually know what this function uh, is supposed to do. But I want to stress, this is not a list of requirements. So we really have to make a translation from this specification to the list of requirements. We can see that highlighted as well by this footnote. The text is really not so clear that it could do without the footnote. So um, you need that to understand the full text. Uh, if we look a little bit closer into the bottom green thing, that's a true requirement. That's really a, a nice requirement. It says string copy function returns something. That is what it's supposed to do. Uh, paragraph three is also a nice requirement. It says, okay, if the array points is blah, 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 then you have to do this. So that's a really good requirement. The blue thing sort of in the middle, just thrown in there, um, this, yeah, it, it says this is undefined behavior if you have a certain condition. Now that's that's also a bit weird to put it right in there. It would be much nicer if these function descriptions had a precondition, a description of the preconditions, and then it could say the precondition for this function is that these objects S1 and S2 do not overlap. And obviously, if you violate that precondition, then your behavior is undefined. And the red bit, yeah, that's the really difficult sentence. Uh, and we have translated it here into 
two requirements. So here are the two requirements that we distill from that one sentence where, um, yeah, uh, we differentiate the case, the case where the string is less than n or the string is uh, not less than n. So that's about yeah where we get the requirements from. Um, then finally, what you have to do when you do uh, this kind of qualification in safety critical uh, uh, application and safety critical environment, you have to show the requirement, the full requirement traceability all the way from the standard to the test and the test result. So that's what we do in our tools. We present this and uh, we present these uh, yeah these 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 records of what we've done where we say okay uh, we are verifying something in the c90 standard here in, in section uh, 7 11 2 4 uh, it's called the string copy function that's the title of the section then we have a specific requirement specification here with a requirement text specified and that requirement results in a test specification for the test that is implemented uh, in that specific path in the in the test suite, and then the test specification text is over here, and we pay attention to uh, boundary values and, uh, uh, and and general cases in this test specification as well. And finally, there's here a result of the test where it says passed. Now, in a proper uh, report, this would all be uh, nicely in a in a, uh, in a sort of spreadsheet like model where for every line you have this uh, full definition of, of uh, um, a trace from the language specification all the way to the, uh, to the test and the test result. Now to derive test cases, uh, yeah, there's some methods are, are typically um, uh, uh, given and uh, the four uh, ways to do that here are the analysis of the requirements. So we've just learned about the requirements uh, generation and analysis of equivalence classes. So if you have something like an addition function, you cannot try to do every value in the integer domain. You have to uh, choose representative values and those form a equivalence class uh, or equivalence classes. You have to uh, analyze boundary values. If you're thinking about mathematical functions, things like infinity, not a number, zero, uh, 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 very small subnormal floating point numbers, all of those are uh, boundary values in the domain. And finally, yeah, you have to be able to think as a des test designer as well. You have to think about, okay, what are the difficult uh, cases? Another thing that you have to take care of is, is sort of show that your, um, yeah, your test suite is complete. And one way to do that is that you use code coverage uh, of the implementation of the library. And that, if you show complete coverage of your library implementation, then you can show, okay, my test suite uh, is, is complete for this implementation. And that comes up on top of the, um, on top of the requirements analysis. Okay, that's my talk. Uh, if you want to find us, you can find us at uh, solidsense.nl and maybe there's a little bit of time for some questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marcel. Uh, any questions from the Early audience in Shanghai? Uh, can uh, I'm unmuted? Yeah, I can can you not? Oh yeah. So any questions from the audience at Shanghai? From the audience online? Please unmute yourself. Okay. Uh, thank you, Marcel. I had a very quick question. So when you showed the 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 slide with all the ACL, A, B, C, and D uh, spec specifications and uh, the D and and how the uh, how they are each uh, what do you call uh, aligned? Uh, what is the meaning of those uh, single plus and the double pluses? What do they mean? Do they mean the percentage of uh, importance that each of those components ah, yes, are applied yes, for yes, each? Yes. I'll look up the slide. One moment. There we go. Share the window. Here we go. 
yeah, this slide. Yeah, these, yeah. These, uh, yeah this is this comes from the ISO 26262 uh, yeah. functional safety standard for the automotive industry. And there they have recommendations of what methods to use for different ASOs. And the ASO level is the, the level of risk for the application. So um, yeah. if you have a low risk application, that would be ASO A. If you have a very high risk application, that would be ASO B. And for these different uh, ASO levels, they recommend uh, different methods more or less uh, strictly. So you see, yeah, there's a sort of uh, more uh, emphasis on, on the boundary classes and the, and the equivalence classes for ASO D. But in general, for this table, there's not that much differentiation. But uh, in other tables, uh, sometimes you do have things that are really strongly recommended for one level or another. And it's it's an industry standard. It's developed by the industry. Yeah. So the background is also they keep into account, okay, what are the economic costs of applying certain methods to uh, to do this? Okay. Yeah, makes sense. Thank you. Thank you, Marcel. Um, You're welcome. Once again, we are on time, uh, surprisingly perfectly on time. Uh, thank you all all the speakers uh, thank you all for your time uh, i know this has been different time zones for different people uh, thank you again for joining us for this uh, work in progress and industry pitch session uh, if you do have any more questions or if you would like to discuss more on any of these topics that the presenters did present please uh, reach out to them uh, through gather town or uh, at the poster session where the presenters will be available to answer your questions and talk more. Um, yeah, this is. Thank, thank you, all the speakers. Something from the. Do we have something from the Shanghai room? There was someone looking into the camera. Is that? Did they want to say something? I guess no. Okay. Uh, thank you, all the speakers and uh, Riley for. Uh, <laughs> uh chairing the session so let's uh, meet and chat in gather town bye bye have a good day everyone thank you all thank you everyone have a nice thank day you. bye, -bye.